Hello everybody, kia ora, um, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I am Emma Hudson-Doyle from um, the SCANS Executive Committee and I'm really pleased to see you all here um, joining us to watch the next of our conference sessions today. Um, and today we'll be talking about entering the science, science communication space and we'll have some experience shared by three panel speakers that we're very fortunate to have speak for us today. Before we proceeded, I just wanted to introduce you to SCANS, um, as I know some people will be joining today that haven't, um, that are new to us. Um, so SCANS is short for the Science Communication Association of New Zealand, and it's a network of people who tell stories about scientific topics. We tend to hold regular events um, for people to come together to network, get to know each other, hone their storytelling and science communication skills, and generally get to know other like-minded professionals interested in science communication. So today we will have three speakers talking about their experiences of entering the science communication space. They will each talk for 10 minutes and then at the end of the, ten, of the three speakers, once all three have spoken, we'll have our Carrero um, amongst us and that will also include question and answers so please feel free to write your questions into the Q&A. Um, the chat function is turned off so most of you by now will be familiar with this. Post your question in the little Q&A box at the end at the bottom of the Zoom and we'll work through those at the end of the session. Um, as this is a panel please do make sure to indicate who your question is for so we know who you are asking. Um, just so you all know, as um, with the other sessions, it's being recorded for viewing later. Um, we will be putting closed captioning onto the recordings before they're sent out. So there might be a, a wee delay before they get sent out, but they will come out due, in due course. So um, before we proceed with the actual presentations, um, I wanted to introduce you to each of our speakers. So uh, first of all, we have Linda Jane Keegan. Linda, if you want to just say hi. Kia ora. Kia ora, Linda Jane. Um, so Linda Jane is an environmental educator. She's a writer and a parent who teaches kids in kids right there out in the bush. Um, she's written a fantastic children's book and writes academically on ecology. Um, you can read more about her and all our speakers on our um, the full bios on our program page. Um, next up, I wanted to introduce Carol. Um, Carol Verges, say hello. <laughs> Hello Carol. Um, so Carol started out as an astro tourism guide after a BSc in astronomy and she spent the last five years in various science communication roles ranging from a physics teacher to her current role at Massey in the STEM outreach um, and she's also involved in the Royal Astronomical Societies and working towards um, a master's in public policy. And she has a mission to empower underrepresented groups in STEM. And uh, lastly, we have Shannondor Brown. Um, Shannondor, do you want to say kia ora or hello? Kia ora. <laughs> kia ora, Shannondor. Um, so Shannondor is a promoter of STEAM with the extra M. So that's science, technology, engineering, maths, and mataranga Māori, and education here in Aotearoa. Um, she's a specialist teacher of technology at Papakura Intermediate School and um, her students created the first Māori Astronomical Alliance School Playground, which just sounds awesome. Um, and she's currently working towards a Master of Technological Futures, which has been exploring um, activities such as concepts of projecting a 3D digital avatar of, as a kaitiaka of a river system. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about all three of our speakers fascinating topics. Um, as said, as questions come in, just as you get questions, just put them into our Q&A. And I am now going to hand over to our first speaker, Linda Jane. So um, I'll hand over to Linda now, Linda Jane now. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, ko Linda Jane Toku Ingoa. Uh, I want to start off first by acknowledging um, the land on where I live and work. So where I live is of uh, Ngāti Whātua or Ōrake and where I work is of Te Kawaro Amaki. Uh, te Kawaro Amaki um, are the iwi of um, Te Waunui Terua, which is more commonly known as the Waitakere Ranges. Uh, 
Te Wao Nui Atirua is the great forest of Te Riwa, and Te Riwa is one of the, old, is the oldest ancestor um, of Te Kawaro Amaki, uh, coming over on the Tainui Waka. And uh, the story about him, as is, is, has been told to me, is that he wanted to impress everybody and prove how strong he was. So he actually picked up a huge, huge rock um, over in Te Wao Nui Atirua, and he walked across the ranges, leaving these huge footsteps behind, and out into the Waitamata, where you know when you want to go out in the water, especially this time of year, it's starting to kind of get warm. Well, maybe depending on, maybe not if you're Wellington. Um, starting to get warm, and you're going out in the water, and the water's getting higher and higher, and you're like kind of thinking it's a bit cold. So same thing happening to Tirua. He's holding his big rock, and the, that water hits that region, and he's oh, and he drops it, uh, and that rock is what we now know um, as Rangi. So that's the um, ancestor of uh, Te Kawaro Amaki, uh, where I work um, over at the Arikiki Nation Cape, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but that kind of brings me to my ancestors. Um, my ancestors are from Singapore, China, England, and Ireland. I was born in Singapore, grew up in uh, Tamaki Makoto, um, which is where I am now. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about how I came to be where I am now, which is um, an environmental educator at Arataki Education Centre, where school groups come in and uh, we run all sorts of programs about forest ecology, stratification, uh, effects of pest control and outdoor challenges uh, covering things like uh, navigation, um, cooking on fires and over uh, on fires and with stoves and putting up tents and all that kind of thing. Um, so I've also written um, a picture book as Emma mentioned where I managed to sneak some science in there uh, and do a little bit of academic writing as well around uh, climate change, effects of climate change on New Zealand's biota and on Cody tree ecology. Um, but going back to where I came to be, I um, a few years ago when I was studying, I heard I went to see Jane Goodall speak, and she's probably one of those premium uh, science communicators. And she told a story about how when she was a kid, she picked up these this handful of worms and she brought them inside because why wouldn't you? Um, she brought them inside and her mother was a bit like, oh, well, this is really great that you found these, but, you know, maybe we need to put them back where they belong and, you know, back into the earth and, you know, encouraging her and doing the right thing with it, but um, really fostering her love of nature. And I have a very similar story from probably around the same age where I too had a handful of worms, which I brought into the house and um, hid in the closet with, I'm not really sure why, but um, I had a quite different reaction from my mother who promptly scolded me and sent me back out. Um, but that was kind of the first taste of thinking about um, looking back and seeing um, how I was really taken by um, things outside. I was also really keen on wanting to categorize things. I would look out in the flowers in the garden and think, I wanna make a booklet. Um, I'm gonna fly, to put all the flowers into a little booklet. I'm gonna draw them. Um, but I came into this problem, which was, how am I going to know which flowers are flowers and which flowers are weeds? I mean, that was, I mean, this is a mystery to me, and um, I decided it was too hard, so I just didn't do anything with this project. Um, so, you know, thinking now, I'm thinking, oh, imagine if I had been, um, someone had encouraged me further. Um, but some things, I guess, were a little more horrifying. Uh, I had liked to collect insects, and I had a praying mantis and a cricket. You know those cascade felt boxes? If you grew up in New Zealand, you know what I'm talking about, those plastic clear containers. And they, uh, we had a, I had a praying mantis and a cricket in there because that's cool. I got these two insects, awesome. Um, but of course, the praying mantis ate the cricket. Um, I was horrified, and um, little did I know that a few more years in the future, I'd be talking to kids about this exact um, same thing. So a little taster of past me, but if you fast forward into intermediate, my sister was in high school and she hated science. So being highly influenced by her, I obviously also hated science. Um, and I really struggled with science fears the most because I, you had to come up with something to do. What was my project gonna be? I took an idea, my first idea in form one, uh, year seven from a book, um, thanks Babysitter's Club. Uh, and I made up in the second year, a weird idea about baking ingredients and how they responded to heat but not trying to bake anything just individual ingredients like flour a little pile of sugar a little pile of baking soda um into the oven i don't i have no there was no purpose to it i had just had no idea what i was doing um the idea of having a hypothesis made no sense to me if you're going to say what you think is going to happen then don't i really know what's going to happen or why would i need to do the experiment otherwise I was saying what I knew was, oh, I don't know, I was so confused. Um, the idea of a literature review was far, far, far away from me at that point. 
um, and through high school, I dropped science as soon as I could in favor of the arts. So that wasn't, science was it like, I don't, that wasn't me. But fast forward again, um, into my twenties, I went to a summer camp in the States where I went back quite a few years to the same place. And I ended up working in the year round outdoor um, outdoor education program where they were running environmental science lessons for school kids coming in. And I didn't have a background in that, but um, I learned heaps on the job. I was probably more excited than the kids would be scooping for macro invertebrates. And there I'd be being like, oh, I've never seen one of these. This is so cool. And kids would be getting excited about that as you would expect when you're excited. Um, and then I just, yeah, I learned heaps while I was there. And it really was kind of in the background here, simmering away. Um, as an outdoors person as well, I love tramping and getting out caving and doing that kind of stuff. So it made sense to me to eventually come back and study ecology, um, which is what I did. Uh, I went back to university in 2013. Um, I was a super nerd there too. I was one of those students who sat near the front and like shushed people behind me. That was me. Um, <laughs> but you can see there's an obvious pathway, working with kids, um, going to study ecology to where I am now teaching kids um, about science in the forest and around nature and the environment. Um, but one of the best things I did while I was at university was I volunteered um, in the lab with one of my lecturers. Uh, I did some work with Dr. Kate mcginnis -Ing. Some of you might know her. She's amazing. I kind of felt like she took me on as an unofficial mentee. Um, and I would kind of continue a relationship where i had done some work with her, um, writing up some research. And that's where I got into doing the academic writing um, that I've been involved in. Um, if you're listening, Kate, I invite by you very much. Um, but after finishing university, I had a baby, so that, you know, took up most of my bandwidth um, at that time, but I kept in touch with Kate and um, did that research, I got out to do some field work, um, and I think the takeaway um, for me from that is that if you have the opportunity as a person coming into as an emerging science communicator to find someone to be a mentor or kind of fill that role or to support you, it's so, so valuable, and on that same token, if you're in a position um, to offer that kind of guidance and support to another person who's coming up in their career, then I was, if you have this time and space to do that, I would so encourage you to really help support um, our upcoming science communicators. Um, I never thought of myself really as a science communicator. I, um, you know, those are, those are big, those were other people, Susie Wiles and Jamie Morton, people writing articles or, you know, communicating to the masses. But of course, as an educator, I'm doing that all the time. And we all are in different ways. Um, you know, journalists, scientists, teachers, government, council employees, all kinds of people, um, we're all communicating science and I think the key thing is to keep an eye out for opportunities. Um, I definitely was excited to be offered the opportunity to speak um, at this conference um, and taking up other uh, professional development opportunities in my other work, um, learning more about Rongoa Māori um, over at Arataki. Uh, I did the Story Collider and um, Science Media Centre storytelling workshop um, recently that had the story slam if you uh, saw that last week um, and that's just been a really great way to kind of keep myself involved and keep part of things so that's what I want to say about that thank you. Thank you Kia ora. Um, thank you so much Linda Jane that was really good I really enjoyed how you referred to the lots of different inspirations for science communication that are in the environment and how we are all science communicators you know it's not necessarily this uh, uh, you know uh, individual elsewhere but it's we are all science communicators across our jobs and our roles and um, so um we will move on to the q a later on um but for now i wanted to move across to carol and she's going to speak um about her experiences as an emerging science communicator. So thank you, Carol. Yeah, kia ora. and thank you so much. Um, it's really awesome listening to you, Linda Jane, and what your journey has been like. Um, co Carol Aho. And um, I guess I wanted to share a little bit about what my science communication journey has been. And so to do that, I've created um, a timeline of um, what that sort of looked like. Um, I would say I've probably been in, in science communication or you know, actively participating for the last five years. And um, as Emma pointed out, I started off um, in 2015 as an astrotourism guide in Lake Tikapur. Um, so I got my degree in astronomy and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and so, um, when the opportunity opened up to go and work as a tour guide, I took it. And um, 
that is where everything started. And since then, I would describe it similar to being in one of those pinball machines where you're kind of just like slammed from one end to another. And so I've done quite a few different things trying to explore where science communication can take me. And also during that process, it's also developed my own sort of mission and vision and what my values are and why I'm in this um, role itself. So I'll start off in 2015. So I started working as an astrotourism guide. And in that I um, met some amazing people that used to that came to Mount John um, at the observatory and they invited me to take part in something called the Space and Science Festival that was held in Wellington. And I got to go and talk to a whole bunch of little kids there about planet hunting because as my role there in, at Earth and Sky, I also got the opportunity to do some research observations for a collaboration on um, planetary hunting using gravitational microlensing. So I got to talk to all these little kids about what gravitational microlensing was and how I was looking for planets in other solar systems. And so I've got a photo over here of me um, making a lot of balloon alien um, figures. And that was kind of my, one of my roles there was just to make those. Um, but from there and spending that time in Tech Four, I really enjoyed it. And I really loved showing people through telescopes for the first time. And they'd look at these amazing objects of the universe and you can, you can hear it in their voice and they just go, wow. Or like, oh my God, like I've never seen anything like this or experienced anything like this. And I got to really share my love for astronomy and stars. And I think my own passion for my subject also developed because I was able to share that. And then I moved away from Tekapur because I needed to, I wanted to do more with this. And so I landed in Dunedin um, at the Otago Museum in a science communicator role. And that really broadened. I went from talking about just astronomy to talking about um, the rainforest that we had there at the museum and talking about geology and doing a whole bunch of outreach there. And that really pushed me outside of my own area of expertise as well. It's also where I met um, Susie Cato for the first time when she was as a child, like as a child, someone I saw on TV doing so much SciComm work. Um, but after that, I left um, uh, Dunedin and I sort of kind of wandered back to Christchurch, figuring out what to do. And I sort of came upon the whole Twitter group of science communicators that was active on there. And that's when I first met Susan Rapley at the University of Canterbury. And we used to hang out for coffees and I'd talk to her and I'd be like, I really want to do this and I don't know what to go, <laughs> what to do about this. And I don't know how to go about this. And eventually I sort of stumbled back to Auckland where I grew up, so Tamaki Makoto, and I started doing my teacher training as a physics teacher um, through the University of Auckland. And I was like, well, I want to do science communication. And I guess the people I see them doing it successfully would be teachers because they get to shape and mold all these young people coming through the education system. And what a way to like, talk about misconceptions and all these things that are out there and you know fake news back then <laughs> um, and I thought that was going to be like the best way to go about doing my psychom work and actually inspiring people to come into sciences and experiencing all this amazing science that I love being a part of um, that wasn't enough for me so while I was doing my teacher training I also um, joined in um, went into the Auckland Astronomical Society and I was a big part of um, just helping out there doing presentations and doing workshops for helping people act, like learn how to use a telescope. So I've got an image there of um, what um, one of our nights out looked like. I was also back in Wellington doing the Space and Science Festival and you can see one of Susie's glow in the dark um, bacterial artwork. We were all painting them um, and taking photos of um, Susie's bacteria. And then come to 2018, uh, 17, I started, sorry, 18, I started work as a teacher at Howard College um, here in Auckland. Um, I tried to explore SciCom further from my teaching. I actually went and um, hired a friend of mine and spent quite a bit of money to try and take a 
60 second video and you know spent about maybe a thousand dollars trying to figure out how can I make like a really professional YouTube quality video and then I was like oh this is too expensive there must be like better ways <laughs> to do this but it was my way of exploring what it would be like you know having all those professional lights and the cameras and going through the whole editing suite of things um not really my thing I still enjoyed experiencing that um but I did want to do more so I stepped into my role here at Massey in 2019 as a school's STEM engagement leader so just sort of I call myself a hype woman for science and that's how I would sort of explain what my role is um, I got to do a lot as well through all the other networks I've built within my time exploring SciComm, especially from the um, astronomy sector, because that is where my passion lies, is within the stars. And um, through that, through my roles there, I got to organize an event called Her Story, which was bringing in um, women and non-binary people that are in astronomy together um, and running a panel on what it's like being in this field and um, we also, that was also the first time I started looking at accessibility um, within astronomy as well. And um, we had some deaf interpreters there, which made it amazing because we got to um, open it up to a community that I've never seen participate in astronomy. Um, and that also pushed me to organize um, an event in Christchurch for Sign Language Week, where we did a night among the stars, but it was just for the deaf community um, completely. So I've sort of, kind of pinballed around and sort of trying to figure out where I fit in and now I guess I still do my outreach work with within my astronomy community taking telescopes out into the middle of the city sometimes this is me at Silo Park just looking um, getting people to experience what it is that um, I enjoy about my science um, and then this year all of COVID it's made things just a little bit harder to go out there and see cool people but I did start my master of public policy as sort of my next step within my science communication journey so I'm not sure where this is going to go um, myself but I'm really excited for what I've been able to do within the last five years and sort of the whole range of people I've met and the whole uh, bunch of risks that I had to take in order to get where I wanted to go. SciComm isn't I would say a risk-free job it's sort of like something that's going to take a lot of falling down and figuring out things and talking to a lot of people and you know me sort of I remember talking to Susan being like I don't understand why you know there's no not a lot more SciComm jobs or explicitly sci science communication type of roles um, but like Linda Jane said, they come in so many different types of um, ways, you know, as teachers or people in government or um, people that's working around that you don't really necessarily know it, but they are trying to communicate their science and trying to com like, communicate what they do and what they love. So yeah, thank you for letting me share what my journey has been like. And um, I hope you've been able to take away something from that. Namihi Carol, that was really, really great. Thank you. Um, I particularly liked how you kind of talked about that enjoyment aspect of science communication and how we're all, you know, again, that theme of how we, science communication isn't necessarily an explicit role and an explicit person. It's woven through lots of different roles and lots of different people. And how important that passion and love for our science is as a part of that science communication. And planet hunting just sounds fun. <laughs> Um, so next, I want to move on to Shannon Dore. Um, so Shannon Dore, I'm looking forward to hearing about your experiences as well. So I'll hand over to you. Well, kia ora. I'm Shannon Dore Brown. I grew up in South Auckland and I'm now a teacher of technology at my old school in Papakura Intermediate. And I was by no means built for science, education or communication. So how did I wind up here? Uh, I was considered a pleasant child who was reported by my teachers as being a capable student who was not working to the best of her ability and that I lacked motivation and that I had very poor concentration skills in class. So I did find more interesting things in life. I was pregnant at 16 and gave birth to a live baby at 17, a very engaging and painful experience, I must say. I left school to raise my daughter and I started a long intergenerational dependence on our social welfare system. When my daughter turned five, she started school 
and I had an opportunity to do Outward Bound. It changed the trajectory of my life. So I discovered a passion I had for the outdoors, for nature, and in particular for the sea. And I decided to pursue a career in the marine field and found a tertiary bridging program at Auckland University. And this is the first time I experienced academic success coming second in science. I attempted to complete a Bachelor of Science at Auckland Uni, but I quickly discovered it wasn't quite for me. So I wrapped that semester up and I enrolled the following year into a Diploma of Marine Studies at the Bay of Plenty Polytechnic in Tauranga. That's where I became a dive instructor. I acquired experiences firsthand um, into being a marine scientist and I really loved it. Uh, I also graduated top student. This led into a Bachelor of Applied Sciences where I did waver a bit, but there I discovered a passion for technology and had an opportunity to also bring my te reo Māori in. So I've ended up working for Niwa, surveying recreational fishes, collecting kahawai heads, which I had to back my family off from getting at. Uh, I was at the Bay of Plenty Polytech as a computer student support library assistant, as well as academic staff and diploma of fisheries management and customary fisheries. I've worked for Te Whare Wānonga Awanuiarangi as academic staff and a Bachelor of Environmental Studies in the field of surveying and statistics. I uh, also worked for Massa University as a researcher on the health of Te Awanui and Tauranga Moana, and more recently, Head of Math and Science in Te Whare of Maniapoto, but currently a specialist teacher of technology at Papakura Intermediate. And this year, I'm on a teacher's study award. So this journey has led me to a natural love for science and mātauranga Māori. I'm a promoter of STEAM, education in Aotearoa with a double M, including science, technology, you can take environmental engineering, I like environment, um, arts, math, and mātauranga Māori. So last year, I helped facilitate a student-led project that developed one of New Zealand's first astronomically aligned school playgrounds based on mātauranga Māori. And our students designed and decided on the building of a playground that I must say cost like $120,000 um, that aligns to Te Waha Tamanui Te Ra. And this is where the pathway of the sun, Tamanui Te Ra, moves when it rises each morning over a year in the east. And in winter, the sun rises in the northwest with Hini Takurua, who is also known as the winter maiden. And in our natural world, we call it winter solstice. Again, the park is also aligned to um, in summer where Tamanui Te Ra rises in the southeast with Hene Raumati, also known as the summer maiden who we call summer solstice. So Mā Tauranga Māori of old does have a place today in science and has our students embraced their cultural backgrounds. They are, we are rangatira in science. This year I had the honour of being invited to facilitate the development of a programme for our year seven and eight, where they go to restore and monitor a part of Te Wairua River at Campadere in the Hanuas of Auckland. I took this programme as a project for my masters with Tech Futures Lab, where I explored how emerging disruptive technologies might enable communities to understand what a river might be communicating to us, is it healthy or not? And ultimately looking at how can we give nature a voice and a body? This is science communication beyond the data and the collection process. I explored the development and building of such devices as the Internet of Things or IOTs, as sensors to give us chemical and physical feedback from the river, such as oxygen levels, turbidity, water levels, pH and electrical conductivity. This tech is not new, there's already IOTs out there. And for example, um, there's an IOT, IOT out there that tells us, you know, what the level water currently is in our dams right now. So New, New Zealand already has a couple of good IOT setups for measuring water quality in riv rivers, and they cost anywhere between $1,500 to $4,000. And I've been looking at building a cheaper device for around $500 or less. So this is because it wasn't so much about the data that we wanted, but what to do with the data. So I also explored how data from IOTs could be used to determine the development of a body for a 3D avatar that would be a visual representation of a kaitiaki or kind of like a personification for the health of that river. And this kaitiaki 
in its own appearance would tell a story. However, the character itself could also tell a story. Now I have a disclaimer to make. I did not build this or get to do it because I would need a few small things, including $50,000 and a key stakeholder who was interested in seeing the kaitiaki come to life with an application to it. So I do have two possible applications to consider. Firstly, a 3D avatar that is located on a map on a river and observers can visually can get a visual idea of what's happening at that river at a particular place. It'd be a little bit similar to Auckland Council's swim safe symbols that they currently use to tell you if it's safe to swim there or not. Um, this application is easily done and it is at low cost. The second application, the far more expensive one and more complicated, looks at a 3D avatar as a mixed reality digital agent similar to a Pokemon in a fixed location and the kaitiaki could be fixed to a river, school or a lamppost indicated in the real world by nothing or by a metal sculpture where people can aim their phones to see the 3D digital avatar that springs up and its body will tell you a story of the health of the river. Um, but also the kaitiaki could be telling you a story or giving you instructions. Say if it was water levels at the dam, it could pop up and say, water levels are low today, it's not a good day to use your water. So working out if I could create this avatar posed problems and I had plenty of barriers this year, particularly with COVID disruptions. My students and I did not get out to the river as much as we would like to, but I can tell you this, our students love being outdoors, where they are being in nature, being scientists, observing the world in which they live. And I didn't have to do much in terms of engaging them, apart from providing a basic framework of learning that they co-designed with me, where they naturally questioned and created their own learning program. Students were naturally engaged, seeing firsthand how low the water levels really are here in Auckland and how Te Wairua River is affected by this and why we are needing to restore an area to stabilize the banks. I didn't have to make anyone motivated or engaged. The potential of STEAM education with a double M um, and out in the real environment does just naturally do this. I also didn't get a chance to collect any data. We lost all funding for our kits um, and getting our hands on a complete set was quite difficult. However, students did consider how they would communicate what the health of a river looked like to them. And not one student produced anything remotely similar. They were representations of dragons, wolves, hay tickies, young water bending girls to sharks and half human, half eel creatures. The point here is the communication of science can be told in the stories that individuals hold or in those stories that collective groups of individuals hold. So let's say I do find a key stakeholder is interested in building this avatar and has $50,000. The trick is not the technology, but in being able to have people work together. For me, science communication is not just about graphs. We now have access to technology that can create ways of communication that are only limited by our creativity. And for me, the skill is not based in using technology, but in the weaving of the hearts and the minds of people to create and utilize information in ways that we can agree on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed um, two things that really struck out to me was, you know, with the playground, it's like that the play is embodiment of learning in like a culturally situated manner. And then also the experiential element of learning outdoors and how like the, that tactile and that feeling and how important that is when we're trying to actually really communicate science, whatever form of science that is. Um, and that the role of, you know, individual and collective stories in kind of sparking that interest in, in when we're educating and communicating science to people. So I really enjoyed that and it's fantastic. And um, I wanna say before we move into the Q&A, so just to everybody, if you want to um, ask any questions of our panel speakers, please put them in the Q&As um, far away. And the 
to all three speakers, I think one of the things that really was really enjoyable about them was just hearing about your different life and career pathways. They're so inspirational. I think often we have, um, you know, we hear about these science communicators and we think, you know, how do they get there? And it seems very kind of like a distant goal. Whereas in actual fact, when we hear all these different career pathways, we realize that actually there's lots of different ways to get to that. And there's, it's not always this kind of A to B to C. It's like the, the, the winding journey that we can all have actually really strengthens that science communication um, that we do at the end of it, basically. Um, so I've got one question here that I will read out so far, and that's um, from someone anonymous. They just wanted to thank you um, and said it was very inspiring to hear all your mahi and the non-linear pathways that are involved in becoming a SciComm hero. So actually that was <laughs> reiterating what I was just saying. Um, I think one of the things, oh, Susan's uh, speaking. <laughs> We're just oh yeah, Susan. Got it, Emma. Um, I just thought I might kick off the questions. Um, and first of all, say to Carol, um, thank you. Such a surprise and grateful to be part of your journey. <laughs> um, I was wondering. Um, so there. I'm not sure if I can communicate this efficiently, uh, science communicator, but um, <laughs> sometimes there are moments where you just go like, yeah, this is what I really want to be doing. I remember a student telling me that um, they loved my teaching so much that they decided to change their majors to what I was teaching. And um, I wonder if you've had any moments like that, that just, I suppose, has solidified your decision to Join us as science communicators. Um, I've definitely had that um, in teaching. Um, students are very good at giving you feedback um, when they absolutely love your work or when they just don't understand what's going on. And I think um, one of the other things I also learned about being a science communicator or being a communicator itself is does the person who I'm talking to understand what I'm trying to get across to them? And, um, and, and kids are great because, you know, you get those blank stares where, you know, they know that they haven't got what you're trying to say, or, you know, you really get that like spark or that light in their eyes. They're like, oh, miss, like no one's explained it that way to me, or this makes so much sense, or, you know, and they'd be like, oh, now I really want to go and do astronomy, and you're like, cool, just make sure you can get a job after <laughs> doing that science, so, but go ahead. Cool, cool. Um, Linda Jane or Shannon, or did you, either of you have anything of those moments that you kind of really catapulted your your um inspiration into science communication i'll ask shannon I'll, door first <laughs> i've um i don't know if it's it's for me it's been more around um supporting others like especially our rangatahi um because as i've been coming up and teaching they just really haven't seen themselves as scientists. And I think today in 2020, we really are starting to get that these young kids really can be whatever they want, including being scientists. And there is a natural um, inquisitive nature that they do have. And what I've enjoyed is watching that develop and going, you're a scientist at heart, look at you go. Um, and so I have seen a couple of kids jumping up and going into engineering um, and changing the trajectory of their lives as well. Um, so it's pretty exciting to have that kind of impact. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, Linda Jane, was there any I don't, I normally work with young children and then you don't, I don't see the further outcome, you know, they're not in a position where they're choosing what they're studying at university or what their career path is going to be. But I think about the experiences that I had as a young person. I mean, my dad was always taking us on outdoor trips and I spent a lot of time in the outdoors looking in rock pools and all of that. Um, and I think if I give one child and one group in one whole year some a positive outdoors exp learning experience, um, then I've done a good job. I mean, hopefully it's more than one, but <laughs> um, I, 
But the most satisfying is thing is when you get a kid who's really engaged and interested in what you're talking to them about and asking lots of questions. And, um, you know, there are sometimes kids who do ask us, you know, how, how can I get this, you know, do you like your job? How can I get this job, you know? Um, mm. So I just like to think more as, you know, we're getting them out there and um, fostering that love for nature and for science that I, I guess I wish had been more fostered in me when I was young, but, um, you know, the, the, the roots were there and it was just a series of fortunate events. Yeah, so it's sparking that passion. Um, so I'm going to read out one of our questions here from um, Sarah Morgan. She asks, um, Kia ora, I'm interested in your opinions on teachers as science communicators in general. How are they doing and how could we better work together or learn from them? So, um, see who wants to answer. Ask first. <laughs> answer first. Carol. I can probably speak on um, from a, as a secondary school teacher um, background. It's really hard um, as a secondary school teacher to be able to do psychom in the way that you want to do it, just because sometimes there's a lot of curriculum and content that you just have to cram through. Like mm. I remember teaching year 11s, 12s and 13s, like you're just teaching topic after topic. And it's really hard to really bring in context, bring in stories. And so I used to try and sneak in astronomy everywhere. Um, you know, when I'm teaching about where the elements come from or in higher, you know, secondary physics, teaching them about um, spectroscopy and where how we found out about you know what elements the sun was made out of so I would try and sneak that in wherever we can but teachers themselves are exhausted and they try as much but it's sometimes very hard also as a teacher to keep yourself updated on what's going on so sometimes even just being in a in a space where they can get revitalized for why they're doing their subjects or even for me if I had more um, access to physics, um, people in the physics uh, sector telling me about all the interesting things that are going on that, you know, I might be trying to sneak into my classes wherever I can, but it is very hard from a secondary perspective. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, how we kind of, ensure, you know, enable that kind of transfer of knowledge in, in current science information from our kind of agencies into something that's useful for teachers is really key. Um, Shannon Dora, your experience as a teacher, did you have anything, um, any comments or thoughts on that? Well, I was going to say, because I'm an intermediate, so year seven to eight, and this is what I'm about to say can extend to um, year eight and nine, so junior college, and you really just have a lot of flexibility in there to play. So, um, and I can see science communication really starting to filter down now into mm. our education system. So the program I'm designing next year around IOTs is actually going to have an element of science communication, like how are you actually going to communicate what you find, what your findings are, but really leaving it open to the kids to say, if you want to play with plasticine, you do that. If you want to play mm. with um, Minecraft or whatever it is, you can do that as well. So um, it's most probably as you know people like us get out into mainstream more and it starts to spread it'll just start to spread out I mean Sarah's going out into education she's going to spread it like wildflowers as well and my probably in her school so <laughs> yeah cool cool and there's ripple effects Linda Jane what were your thoughts I just wanted to add too um from the perspective of someone um in the education outside of the classroom sphere um that opportunity to collaborate with um, informal educators in different ways um, especially you know, knowing that teachers have those curriculum to teach to and there's a lot of other stuff that has to be done you know paperwork and things behind the scenes I'm sure but um, the opportunity to collaborate with um, other people in the fields that you're teaching or maybe areas that are not your strong points I mean we do at Arataki um, bio 2.6 or science 1.12 and those are ones that we we have a curriculum that's designed to cover those things where it might be something to um, collaborate with on um, for teachers. Mm. That's really useful and kind of knowing that there's you know other ways that this, these aspects can be taught kind of and then that brings in that experiential and that that uh, way of learning outside in the outdoors that engaging way. Um, 
we've got a question from Hannah Brightly here, and she says, Kira Koto, thank you so much for your Carrero. It's very inspiring. Um, I work in local government, and I was wondering if you have any tips for trying to convince other people the importance of science communication alongside the technical worth work that both educating internally and within the community. So do you have any tips for trying to convince people that science communication is as, as, as important as technical work um, internally and with the community? So, um, I'll take a volunteer for who wants to go first. Carol, I noticed you unmuted <laughs> yourself. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if anyone you know, figures it out, I'd be keen to know. Um, the, the only way that I've been able to do it in my field is um, because it's astronomy. I don't know. It's a pretty science. I've always just been be like, oh, you want to come, you know, I'll take you out. We'll go see a couple of things through a telescope. And then I might be able to open a conversation about light pollution. And, you know, these are the mm. things that were, that are happening, but um, it is a very hard, um, I would say from like an academic standpoint as well, because um, being here at a university, it's, you've got to focus on your research and you've got to focus on all the things that you're trying to do. And sometimes maybe there's not a lot of focus on, you know, communicating the, that out to um to where it should go so i think that's probably something i'm still working on i still haven't figured it out yeah and um shannon Dor, did you have any um i can it was just around that you know how we really stress that importance of science communication within our organizations and beyond uh what i do know is that there's um policies at a national level that have been you know just begun like, I don't know, is it maybe in the last two years, including, you know, scans coming up, South Side, Curious Minds, and it's really starting to blossom and, and expand. So I see it as starting to become more important. Um, yeah, and again, it's just going to be up to us spreading it out there mm. and um, having more of, I mean, look at all the um, science people that we celebrated and women in science and leadership, all the celebrations that have just been going on right now. Um, yeah, again, I think it's just going to get bigger and better and more beautiful. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and how we're each agents for that in some way. And, and Linda Jane? No, I don't have anything to add. To <laughs> oh, and so um, Susan's going to um, lead the next question. I'll just cool. She's just unmuting herself. There we are. <laughs> Give me my mute's not working very well. Um, so I thought I'd jump onto this secondary question from Sarah Morgan because we're um, team Comet, so she might allow me to expand on it a little bit. Um, Sarah says that she loves you all and you're stellar humans. She's wondering if there's a niche um, here for something for scans to do. Um, like a teacher network uh, where we provide updates about science news, etc. Um, she says something about a segue into support for emerging science communicators. This is where I thought I might expand on her question. So is there a niche here for scans for a teacher network updating about science news? Um, is this somewhere that we can provide support for emerging science communicators? Because I know from some of the work Sarah and I have done together, um, we know that knowing more about the curriculum in schools improves your engagement as a science communicator, regardless of where you're doing that. So um, perhaps you could share some of your thoughts on that. Shall I start by just saying yes and yes? <laughs> um, I'm going to go more to the second part about um, segueing into support for um, emerging science communicators. I sort of think as someone who, um, aside from my environmental education um, with kids, um, are trying to do more um, either academic writing, but not so much that more, um, you know, writing for the general public, you know, kind of translating those um, research articles or thing that's happening into palatable news that makes sense to people who might not have um, a science education background. Um, and I think uh, a neat thing to be would be, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, um, <laughs> but somewhere where yeah, there was a place where we could access um, news or um, re um, um, a recent research um, that might be where we could be then using that to either as teachers share in the classroom where relevant, um, 
with what's you know happening around the world or that's new in science um, um or as sort of freelance writers looking to kind of share that more widely yeah i'll add on to that i think there's always room for those kind of things and there are teacher communities you know um for within like even on facebook you know we've got facebook groups like the new zealand science teachers facebook groups and things like that these communities exist i think um it just has to be palatable and remember not all of these science teachers are experts in all areas so sometimes content that might be out there or content that's written might not um, translate well for them or make it easy for them to be able to share it to a lower level so it's sort of you know how can you help them break those boundaries and make um, content as simple as possible and then you know take for them to take it as broad as they wanted it or even being available for them to you know zoom call you or talk to you about your expertise and things like that I know teachers always appreciate that and I was going to say um even the scans conference itself as a professional development for teachers to come along to like I found it of so much benefit but not just that I you guys offer scholarships. I don't know how much teachers actually know of that, that can actually get them involved um, with that as well. Because now I just find, find myself talking to others and going, oh gosh, you're into science, science communication, you should go to scans, you know? So it's, um, yeah, just getting that out there more as well. And if not running something similar to that, but for teachers, I don't know. That's been fantastic. I think that's really, you know, and it's like bringing together experiences and knowledge to kind of share, you know, how we've um, our passion for it, and then how, as teachers, I'm sure, you know, how you kind of getting ideas of how to teach effectively and inspire students is really key. Um, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee here. This is a very broad question. They say, "I'm hoping to step into this space as a fresh MSc graduate." Do you have any advice you give to your past self as you were just starting your journey? So if you had a, a magic wand and could go back to the beginning of your journey, what advice would you give yourself? It's a, it's a great question. <laughs> so, Carol? Um, so I'll go first again. <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed my science communication journey. It's been like sort of like a hit and miss, but I have so many stories I can tell now. I have so many different perspectives and people I've met through all of this around the country um, that I wouldn't really change my science communication journey at all. It's been a bit rough. And to be honest, sometimes it doesn't pay very well either. But, um, you know, it's it's been such a huge part in, in shaping me and developing me as an individual. And like I said, my my mission and vision and my values are all about getting more people like me who look like me um, you know, into STEM and knowing why it's important for us to be present even at those higher decision-making levels. Um, so that sort of developed over time, but um, take the risk. If you see something that's relatively you know, doable for you and you've got the skills and you're wanting to develop yourself, go and try out all the different kinds of roles that are out there because you never know who you're going to meet and you never know where things are going to take you from there because SciComm is not linear at all. Yeah, I'll just tag on um, from what Carol was saying that, I mean, there is no one linear pathway um, in science communication or really in any career or just life in general. I mean, go back and say, oh, I, I wonder if I should have done this differently or this is what you should do now as your next step after um, graduating. I mean, I didn't, in high school, I didn't do sciences, which made studying biology um, as a 30 year old with all like back at university being like, oh, this is, I'm not familiar with any of this, but I mean, these are things, if you're really interested in them and have a passion for it, you're going to invest the time and energy into it. So I think passion is the most important. If you are really excited about something, um, go in that direction. Um, and if that direction changes and you're like, that actually does not do it for me anymore, this is the thing. It might, you know, mm -hmm. I think just um, take advantage of opportunities that come, look for opportunities and um, just follow what really gets you excited. And Shannon Yeah, I had to find that unmute button. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I reckon I was pretty um, serious and stressed out. I'd most probably just say relax 
that's what I tell my and just relax I used to stay up till midnight trying to get things you know getting everything um right and correct and stuff so yeah I just say relax enjoy the moment cool that's um that's just been really uh, it's really important advice and really interesting um we've got a few minutes left so I kind of thought it'd be interesting to just go around the three of you and just think about if you had any kind of one more you know one tip I mean we've kind of covered that a bit with this question but um you know any kind of last thoughts about you know that emerging science journey and like how to keep that momentum going through your science communication journey as you kind of get to where you're going. Um, so uh, I think, um, Carol, did you want to start? Sure. Um, I think just for me, the most important uh, learning I've done is that um, it's not going to be perfect. Whatever your passion is, um, you have to cultivate it. You're going to have to work on it. And it's going to suck at the beginning, but you will get better at it as you go. Um, and just, just keep with it, have patience and keep going. Because if it's something that's important to you, then it does require your time. It does require your patience and it does require you to invest energy into it. Um, so, so you, if, you, if it goes bad first, don't worry about it. It can only go better from there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Linda Jane? Um, as a dabbler in interests, I often think about my um, missed calling for various other um, professions or careers or skills that I could maybe now be just really good at. <laughs> um, but we can't do everything. Um, maybe maybe we can, some people can. Um, I'm not those people. Um, <laughs> um, so I think it's okay to know you have, accept that you have lots of interests and um, spend time on one or more of them. Um, but um, I guess what I'm getting at is it's okay. You don't actually have to be really amazing at everything. You could be just a little bit good at lots of things, which is, I guess, what I'm trying to do. And it takes time. Um, I guess I'll use this opportunity now to um, plug my picture book. Um, <laughs> things in the sea are touching me. Now, I um, I really enjoy kind of writing in general. And I've obviously written a children's picture book, but I've also written, um, you know, academic literature. And I thought, well, what's somewhere vaguely in the middle of that is I'm going to include some science um, in this book for kids because that's how I roll um, and I think I there's not as I said before there's not the one one pathway or one you know you don't have to necessarily be I am super proficient in this one area and if you if that's your dream then that's amazing do it um, but I have never quite felt drawn to one thing to stick at only that um, I've had a very like higgledy piggledy like job um, job history so I think, yeah, I don't know. My life got the thing has always just been to follow what um, interests you and take opportunities where they come up. And um, you can mix and mash your different interests together and you don't necessarily have to be um, the top expert in all or even one of them. Yeah. And, and Shannon Dorf? I think everyone pretty much says it. So I'm actually going to thank you guys and scans and everybody else that's taken their time here and it's really been a pleasure um, sitting here with you all. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon Dorr. Um, yeah, and we've had a, some comments coming through in the Q&A just saying, you know, it's been a great session and really enjoying hearing from you. And it's been, it's a real privilege to hear these journeys and, you know, thank you for sharing them with us. I think, um, you know, as you were saying, each of you about these different pathways that lead you to the science communication roles you're in at the moment, it's actually that different pathway and the fact it's a kind of a winding journey is what makes really effective science communication, I think, because you can connect people from different from their different backgrounds and their different experiences and draw on your different experiences to build that relationship that really, really helps science communication. So. I guess that the take home message would be, you know, it's not, it's not just one path. There's, you know, we can come to science communication and that we're all science communicators, you know, and, you know, experiencing science and bringing that experiential element to it. So I just wanted to, you know, say Namahi Nui, you know, we really, really thank you so much 
for providing these amazing stories and and sharing them with us and um namihi katoa to everybody that's attended and and you know involved and you know feel free to send us other questions after the after this session um you will be receiving a recording of the session in case you want to listen back to a little bit. Um, and I know I'm going to be going and <laughs> getting a copy of the book on my in, in there's a Christmas stocking that's got one of those books in it for a little preschooler at home. And, you know, that's the, the, the role of children in science communication is another just so important. Um, so thank you for everyone for attending and um, do just a reminder again that we're here again tomorrow at 12 30 um, for the talk headline behind the scenes with the unite against covid 19 campaign creators which is like a really exciting talk with um linda major from the director of social marketing at clemenger and she um will be talking about that you know that that white and yellow banner communications, all of that whole program of communication behind Unite Against COVID. So it's going to be a fantastic talk. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so for now, I'll say uh, Namihi Kato and uh, Matawa. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Kara, thank you. Thank you.